one of the things that Julian and I have been talking about a lot right now, because I just turned 40 a few months ago, is never settling. And I don't mean never settling, like you always have to be PRing and this and that, but always growing in some way, always Mm -hmm. still seeking out some discomfort and trying to be a little bit better in one area or another all the time. It's not about perfectionism or anything like that, but I think just trying new things and improving, whether it's like uh, one area that I could improve, another area is like I could eat more vegetables. So just never, never settling. And that's in relationships and education Mm -hmm. and all of that. Hello, and welcome to Pursuing Health. I'm Dr. Julie Fouché, family physician and former CrossFit Games athlete. Here, I bring you information and inspiration to help bridge the gap between fitness and medicine and support your journey toward your healthiest self. Thank you so much for joining me. Now let's get started with this week's episode. Well, welcome back to Pursuing Health. I am really excited to be here today with Miranda Elkaraz, who I have not caught up with in a while. So this is going to be really fun. Um, before we just dive in, I'd love to give a little bit of background. I think most of my listeners know who you are, but, um, Miranda has a background in CrossFit from many facets, um, competing at the CrossFit games as an individual and as a member of team NorCal. She also is one of the very few CrossFit level four trainers that exist in the world, a former seminar staff flow master working over 300 seminars and has played various roles as well on the CrossFit media and broadcasting teams. Um, But these days, she's also probably better known as the CEO of Street Parking, which is an at-home workout community that she co-founded with her husband, Julian, and a mom to three young boys. So we have a lot to catch up on. I can't remember (laughs) when the last time is that we were together, but most likely one of those maybe last CrossFit games that we both competed in. so a lot has happened since then. So thank you for taking the time. I'm excited to to chat. Yeah, I feel like we've had like random like mini interactions like here and there yeah. like on social media and stuff. But yeah, and like when I think we ran into each other at one game somewhere along the way as a as we were there spectating. But yeah, it's been a while. But I, I mean, I don't even know where to start. I feel like <laughs> <laughs> I feel like it'd be great to just start with sort of your fitness story for people who aren't aware of how you how you got into fitness and into CrossFit from the beginning, because, you know, even before you were really involved with CrossFit HQ, you were also an affiliate owner, which I didn't mention in your bio. (laughs) Yeah, I, um, so I grew up in a family. I have five siblings, four of them are brothers. Um, and we weren't necessarily like a super, they were active, like they played sports and I, uh, well, they played hockey and I played hockey when I was super young. But like growing up, I wasn't super involved in in sports. I was like more like dance and cheerleading. I did a bunch Mm -hmm. of like musicals and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I had some friends when I was in high school that liked to work out. Um, Specifically, my boyfriend in high school, his mom was a spin instructor. Okay. And I would go to her classes because it was fun. Um, This was like the original Peloton. Okay, everyone. Yeah. Actually go to (laughs) class and we made the cool playlists like Peloton did not and like (laughs) invent this concept. Okay. But um, yeah, so I would go to her classes because they were super fun. And then I was interested in doing it because I loved it so much. And so that's where I got into like fitness and and coaching, I guess. So the very first thing that I ever coached was uh, spinning classes. Johnny G spinning was my first certification. Nice. And then I taught when I was in college, I taught um, like cardio kickboxing and the spinning and like some like group fitness classes, basically. Mm -hmm. And then I got into personal training. Um, I went to school for something completely unrelated. I was in school for interior design the whole time that I was doing this. Mm -hmm. Which is so unexpected, but also I was just commenting on your beautiful background before this podcast. So it's clear you're still using those skills. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's funny though, right? Because like, I think a lot of times people think of fitness and nutrition as very um, scientific, which it is, but though there's also an art to it. And my favorite Absolutely. part of fitness is programming, mm. um, which is very artistic. As very you know. artistic. Um. So yeah, they, they, they seem unrelated, but in a way that they, they are, um, mm-hmm. there's, there's art within fitness for sure. 
And then I was personal training. Um, even after I graduated from school for interior design, I just found that I was drawn more to helping people with fitness than mm -hmm. helping people pick their curtains, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Both are helping people, but you know, <laughs> right. one seemed Different more ways. fulfilling than the other for yeah. me personally. Um, so I just kind of continued to work in fitness, even though I also had I did do some jobs with, with my interior design, but I, mm -hmm. I just had a passion for fitness more. So I continued down that path more. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I was a personal trainer when I found CrossFit. Um, and it was for me specifically, I was bored with the way that I was working out. Okay. So, um, this was in 2007 mm -hmm. and I Googled, um, Marine Corps training and like Navy SEAL training because I just wanted to do something a little bit more, I don't know, I guess gritty and grimy because mm -hmm. um, I was like in a very high end personal training studio where everything was super polished and we were like standing on one foot on a BOSU ball and doing like <laughs> crossovers right. and it's all very like. I was at that place. And Which I, I also wanted... love that, like thinking, just picturing you in high school as like a dancer, cheerleader, like being in plays, doing interior design and looking at them <laughs> right? like, I really want some gritty workouts. <laughs> yeah. Like I wanted to get back to like, I, like I said, I grew up with four brothers. And yeah. so um, I think I just wanted to, and maybe I was in a place in like my mid twenties where it's like, I want to see what I'm made of more. Like mm -hmm. I feel maybe too comfortable in what I'm doing or whatever. Super cool. Yeah. So I, that's how I found, I just found the website. I lived mm -hmm. in Salt Lake city at the time. There were no affiliates. Um, Chris Spieler is also from that area, but he mm -hmm. was like 30 minutes away. He had an affiliate, but not a location. So he was like inside of a rec center, like in a little corner. Okay. Um, and I met with him a few times when I first found CrossFit to like learn a few movements. Mm -hmm. Um, but then I started doing CrossFit myself. And I loved it so much that I started doing it with my clients, mm -hmm. getting like four or five of them together instead of just training one person at a time. And I got kicked out of the personal training studio <laughs> that I was at because it was just not, you know, the way what I was, what I was explaining before, like it was not, um, as polished, I guess, mm -hmm. I mean, like throwing up in the front of the building sure, and <laughs> sure. breathing too hard and sweating and. Yeah. Yeah. And so <laughs> that's why I opened the affiliate. Cause I was like, well, where am I going to train people now? And I had fallen mm -hmm. in love with CrossFit in a very short time. And so I opened an affiliate and did my level one. And like a few months later did my level two, mm -hmm. which back then was like the like scary level two. What now you think of as level four. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, um, they invited me at the level two to come, set, uh, intern on the seminar staff. So, wow. so it happened very quickly. That's all. Yeah. That all happened by like October of 2008 was my first internship. So it was like wow. all within one year that all happened. That's wild. And then you're, when you went to the games the first time, was that, that was 2009? I went in 2008. I, so okay. the only time I competed as an individual at the games was in 2008, where you could literally just show up and like, they would tell you your heat yeah. time. Still counts. <laughs> it was fun though. That's awesome. That's so cool. So yeah, so it happened very quickly and then must've felt like such a whirlwind to go from opening a gym level one, level two, now you're on seminar staff and you're literally traveling around the world every weekend, teaching people how to do CrossFit, but also at the same time, getting into the sport of CrossFit. Can you just talk about sort of what that journey was like? Yeah. And I think, when did you start CrossFit, Julie? What year? I started in 2009, summer of 2009. And so then my first time. game was 2010. Yeah. You were there like early enough where the sport wasn't at all what it is now. Like no. people definitely, I would say by 2009, were kind of somewhat training for it, but not, not like super thought out planned. Like maybe mm -hmm. they would do, a, you know, they would practice their weaknesses a little bit more mm -hmm. and they would add in a little bit more lifting and stuff yeah. like that. Like most people are still doing one workout a day. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so I didn't really like, I wasn't necessarily on purpose training for the sport back then. If you participated in CrossFit, especially if you worked for CrossFit, you did the open and then mm -hmm. you did, you know, and I was really lucky because of my background where I had been a trainer for a long time. And I was with my dance background and stuff, I was coordinated. So like I could do muscle ups and mm -hmm. I could do heavier, like clean and jerks and stuff. And I got I mean, I rode the coattail of just being able to do stuff that people were failing to like do pretty well for pretty long. Um, 
Like the fact that you, I mean, back in, you know, like 2009, 2010, if you could do muscle ups, you were going to be in the top five at events every yeah. time yeah. because people would just couldn't do it. Mm-hmm. And so, um, I wasn't necessarily training on purpose, like with this massive, like goal to oh, go mm-hmm. and like crush the games or anything really until maybe like 2010, 11. Mm-hmm. And then, um, I, you know, I did well at regionals, but never made it as an individual, um, probably in part because of, I was traveling so much. Right. <laughs> like, right. I remember those times of when I was, I was on seminar staff, but I would work maybe one seminar a month or something. And those weekends were always so hard to get your training in. And you were doing that every single weekend. Yeah. So that was like, I, I look back on it now and I've said this like plenty of times, I probably, cause I think I placed, I placed fifth at regionals in 2011 and seventh in 2012 and 13. And it's like, I probably could have qualified as an individual in those years if I would have not that your done what I was doing with the travel. Yeah. Um, but it were really, like, I, I don't really, even to this day, identify as a CrossFit games athlete. I always identified as a coach mm-hmm. and that was, um, more important to me. Mm-hmm. And for longevity, like career wise, it's probably really good that I Mm -hmm. recognize that. Yeah. Um, And so, yeah. I think that's such an important point to make and for people to to hear because so many people would be like, yeah, you were so good. Why didn't you just focus on that for a couple of years? But like the the reason, there's a why behind it, right? If it's not what actually makes you happy and coach or as happy as coaching and traveling and being with a community all over the world, then you know, do it. You you should do it for you basically. Yeah. And I think like, that's exactly, you're exactly right. Like do it for you. I, um, I was training the way that I was training. I would say the whole time, even through 2015, when I, you know, got injured and then I stopped competing after that, it was always, and the reason that I got into CrossFit, it was, I saw this video, like so many people of like Nicole and Annie and Ava. And Mm -hmm. I was like, I want to do that for me, not Mm -hmm. to impress other people. When I saw that video, there wasn't a games really to win, to go, Mm -hmm. you know, get sponsorship deals or like there, that wasn't a thing. It was like, I want to see how fit I can become as a person Mm -hmm. and what I can, what I can can do and what my body can do. So it was never really for me about winning. I'm I'm not a super competitive person in that way. Like, Mm -hmm. like I said, I didn't grow up like playing sports and stuff. So I don't really have a lot of that in me so much but it's always been about proving that I can do something that I set out my mind to do Mm -hmm. um, physically. And I still have that to this day. So I love that. I see you against you. I, my moment was actually watching all of you at the 2009 (laughs) games running up the hill with the sandbags. Oh my gosh. (laughs) That was my, wow. I, you know, these girls are so awesome. I wonder if I could do that kind of moment. So that's really cool. What was your favorite from all of your years on seminar staff and you know, interacting with the community and different cultures, different places. What do you take away from that? Or what are some of the biggest things that you remember that you learned? The I just love how um, CrossFit and intensity and this, the type of person who is drawn to it, especially the type of person who is drawn to it enough to come to the seminars. Cause those people are like really into it, obviously. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, just this humbleness that there is that a humility, I guess is the, is the correct word, this humility and, um, this desire, like we're talking about to be better and to push yourself and to be open to like letting other people see you fail and learning something new. And, mm-hmm. um, it's the type of person that is there regardless of fitness level or background or age or or any of that or where you live in the world, it's the same type of person. And Mm -hmm. I always loved that so much because, um, it's harder now, but back in the day, like if you were at the airport and you saw somebody wearing like the original nanos, like you knew immediately, like, (laughs) all right, I know like this person and I like the same. And I, that's probably the biggest thing that I learned and that I love to this day so much is when you have that I, I still look for that kind of stuff. And sometimes it's like the random stuff that you see. Julian and I were at a pumpkin patch here in Washington 
uh, like right before Halloween. Mm -hmm. And this guy there had a um, 2013 regionals shirt on. (laughs) And like, we didn't even talk to him, but he looked at us and we looked at him and it was like, (laughs) this like known thing and yeah I think the head nod really like cool okay special. Yeah. <laughs> that's so cool it is crazy how it's grown though now sometimes I I'll see people with rogue shirts and I'll think oh it was rogue they must do crossfit oh gosh, but just it so doesn't big. necessarily <laughs> correlate anymore because rogue is just so big but right but yeah so totally same feeling and I love that I think that's one of the things that it just gets me every time about crossfit is that the um just the humanness of it, the vulnerability. And then when I think about seminars, it's those moments, you know, during the workout where all these strangers are together and they're struggling and they're cheering each other on, even though they don't know each other. It's not like they're in a, an affiliate and they work out every single day together, but seeing that humanness of people just rooting for each other, um, is so powerful. And it's such a metaphor, you know, the way that we can experience that in fitness, and hopefully translate into the rest of our lives is so powerful. Yeah. And just also like the people that were on the team, like every time I get a chance to talk about the relationship that I had with the people that, especially like there were definitely the people that I worked with a lot, like Spiel and Boz. And, you know, we had like a little crew that was together all the time, it, it seems like. And just um, the way that we pushed each other to improve every single time and mm-hmm. just I mean, when you travel with people, you just create this like close friendship. It's like family in Mm -hmm. a way. And I don't, I mean, even with you, like we don't know each other that well. We haven't Mm -hmm. really spent that much time together, but I like, because of what you did and, and like who you are and just what I know, like, I know so much about you without really knowing you. Mm -hmm. Um, And I know that we have so much in common because of that shared experience, even if we haven't spent like that much time together. Mm -hmm. That's so true. That's so true. I love it. Well, one of the things that you talked about again recently, or you shared a video on your social media was the car accident that you had in 2012. And I always thought this was such a powerful example of what CrossFit can do. Um, And it's something I remember even I wrote about in a blog post when I was in med school, when I was talking about CrossFit. Can you share a little bit, just looking back now, it's 10 years later, Looking yeah. back at that experience, some of your reflections. Yeah, I think, you know, my life, I I have like my, maybe I don't listen to lessons or I need to learn lessons by being like slammed into <laughs> yeah, like, I think hey, we all do. <laughs> but I need you to know. But the car accident was definitely one of those things that changed me as like a person and as a, as a coach, for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, it was like a month after the 2012 regionals. So I was like, you know, in very good shape. Mm -hmm. Um, I was at a seminar at lunch and went to go get coffee as you do for the rest of the team. (laughs) Very important afternoon coffee. (laughs) And, um, we're just turning back into the gym and ended up getting in an accident where, um, I was in, you know, a cheap little rental car and this car that the car that hit me was like a bigger Mercedes anyway. And, um, luckily I was by myself because it hit the passenger side, but, was taken in an ambulance to the hospital and they did not do the best job of diagnosing everything that was wrong. And so I ended up walking around for two weeks with an undiagnosed um, hangman's fracture, like a C2 fracture. Um, It was fractured in two places. And I also broke my hand, which they did diagnose. (laughs) Um, And so I went to a hand doctor and I had to go to him when I got home to get a hard cast because it was too swollen at the time. And he asked me about like, my movement. Like I was mm-hmm. clearly very restricted and I just thought it was whiplash, which mm-hmm. I also did have as well. Sure. But, um, then when I went back to him a few, a uh, few days later, it was still, and he's like, I feel like this is not, he was concerned with how I was moving. And so mm-hmm. he x-rayed my neck, but the day after we took the x-rays, I left to go work at the games to, um, interview all of yeah, you guys. That were I competing. remember that you had that x-ray <laughs> on. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, he tried calling me to be like, Hey, your x-ray looks weird. I didn't answer because it's so busy that week. I didn't Mm -hmm. recognize the number. And so I was just working. I was still in a ton of pain. Mm -hmm. I couldn't like sleep laying down. I had to like sleep. (laughs) It sounds crazy when I like, now that I think of it, I was like, what's wrong with you? But I had to like sleep sitting up. I couldn't like bend over the sink to wash my face because that hurt too much. Like 
Um, and when I got home, finally he got a hold of me and, and sent me to go get an MRI. And the MRI tech uh called me immediately after and was like, you need to go to an emergency room. Like you have a really unstable C2 fracture that if you like trip and fall or get in a fender bender or something, like it's gonna paralyze you. And it was mm-hmm. just like 17 days after the accident. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, but yeah, long, I mean, long story long, I guess, maybe not, but they said that if I didn't have the amount of muscle in my upper body and my traps and my neck and everything that basically acted like a neck brace, that whole 17 Mm -hmm. days that for sure, I probably would have just been a lot more injured, paralyzed, whatever in the accident. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's no way I could have walked around for 17 days and not had something bad happen if I didn't have that much muscle in my, in my upper body and my neck. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time where it's like, man, like this is important for people aside from what you look like and aside from like competing, cause I was heavy into competing at that mm-hmm, point. Mm-hmm. It was like, this just the fact that I've been training so hard just saved my life. Like, mm-hmm. um, and the further people are from being fit, the more they need to hear this because the more at risk they are type mm-hmm. thing. You know, we talked about the sickness, wellness, fitness continuum every weekend and I believed it and I understood it, but now I had a personal, like, attachment to it that I wanted to make sure that people understood. Mm -hmm. Wow. It just gives me chills just to think about it. And, and, you know, all the little moments that you could have just moved the wrong way and something could have happened. But I think the other thing that I hadn't heard that whole story before that struck me was the hand surgeon x-raying your neck. It just, Mm -hmm. it raises the flag of, Hey, if you see something that's not quite right, like ask questions and get more information, do about, do something about it, even if it's not your area of expertise. Um, because I think there's a lot of people that get so focused on their specific area and don't pay attention, even if something's off elsewhere. Yeah. And I mean, he, I'm so glad that he asked me about it because he asked me, did they x-ray your neck in the ER? And I was like, no, I told him that my neck really hurt, but they said it was just whiplash. And so, and he even came like, after I had my surgery, he came and checked on me and everything. That's a great doctor. That's awesome. (laughs) That's so great. Wow. Yeah. You never know all the different ways that, you know, CrossFit can help from whether it's bringing in your groceries or the way you look in the mirror or saving your life. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah. Amazing. So then there, there came a point where you started to transition away from the sport. Like you said, you had your knee injury and you, you know, you left competing and eventually transitioned away from, um, from seminar staff. And I don't know if I know that like the timing of all this, but I'm really curious about that time for you. Cause it sounds like a big time of transition. And also I think for so many people, especially when you're doing something for a long time, like, or having the goal of competing, it becomes so much of your identity that it's very difficult to make the decision to do something else or to focus on something else. So can you talk a little bit about what that process was like for you? Yeah, I think it was like, again, my life being like, you need to learn a lesson. And I guess she's, we're gonna, you need to tear your ACL to listen to <laughs> what's going on. Because I had like gotten to maybe the unhealthy point. And I don't know if you ever felt like you did this, but like my entire life in 2015 mm-hmm. revolved around competing. Mm-hmm. Um, I had gotten more to like where I wasn't really working seminars very much. And part of it was because I was on a team. So they relied mm-hmm. on me. So if, so when I was an individual, if I got seventh instead of fifth at regionals, it's not a big deal to anyone else except for me. Mm-hmm. Where at this point, like my best friends in the world, we were all together on this team and we were so close as humans. Mm-hmm. It wasn't I think it's a rare thing to find even on teams now because we had trained together when all of us were just competing as individuals. Like we were very close. It was a very Mm -hmm. tight knit group and um, we took it very seriously and, you know, we were on track to win and it was like, yeah, you were, you were one of the teams to beat. So there was a lot of pressure. Yeah. And um, everything else in my life went to the back burner. Like I said, um, work with CrossFit. Um, I was, I was married to Tyson at the time and Mm -hmm. like, we never saw each other and just weren't working at all on our relationship. And it was all focused on this one thing. And so life Mm -hmm. for my ACL. And I was like, well, now what do I have? Like I've put, I've neglected everything else. Yeah. Everything else is like gone, falling apart. Um, and so 
it was time for me to move on. Like I recognize that, like you have taken this as far as you need to take it. There's nothing else from you to gain Mm -hmm. from competing. You need to, you know, I think I was 33. Mm -hmm. Um, and I knew eventually that I wanted to have kids and everything like that. So it's like, this is, this is like your moment to move on. Mm -hmm. And so, um, Tyson and I, and I ended up splitting, which I think most people know about. And then I was still working for CrossFit, but I moved to Southern California and I started working for a progenics, mm-hmm. um, in that move, in that transition, this was like a few months after the games, um, is when I met Julian mm-hmm. and quite honestly, the reason that I stopped traveling so much and doing the seminars is because I saw how that impacted my relationship before. Mm-hmm. And I didn't want to do that again. And he, Julian was special. So I guess love. love <laughs> Don't make any like, crazy I'm, things, right? <laughs> I know the damage that can be done by like the, the constant travel. Yeah. Um, and I didn't want to, I didn't want to do it anymore. And they were, they were making some transitions in how the seminar staff worked too, like in our, in our contracts and stuff. And so mm-hmm. I just felt like I needed to, to stop doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it wasn't at all because I didn't still love it or because I didn't still love CrossFit or anything. I just wanted mm-hmm. to start over, start fresh after all of that stuff kind of happened. Yeah. It's a lot in a short time. And, and sometimes the world just has to, you know, give you the hard lessons for you to pay attention. I can relate to that also. And, well, and I think like you're so stubborn that you're just like, no, I'm just going to keep going. And it's like, no, right. no, no, now you have no choice. Um, yeah, I can totally relate to that. I think for me, um, you know, during that whole time for it was, it was school. Like you had basically seminar staff and, and competing. And for me, it was school and and competing and, you know, everything else fell to the wayside. It was like, nothing else mattered besides those two goals. And you like now that I'm a much more well-rounded person, I realize how important all those other things are. And I don't know what I was thinking, but back then, I think you can become so focused on certain goals that you just become blind to everything else. Like I even had, I know I had good people in my life who would give me advice about certain decisions. And I don't think I was even able to hear them a lot of times because I, I was so focused on like, this is what I think I want or what's most important. And, um, and I think I probably also was just young and I even, and cared too much about, or, or not cared too much, but thought too much that I should be doing certain things because that's what was expected of me or that's what like, well, that's just what you do instead of really knowing what I wanted. Um, so I can, I can relate to some of those things too. It's so funny. I don't know if you've had this, um, experience, but Julian and I, a lot of times when we first started street parking, we, we called it CrossFit rehab because Mm -hmm. (laughs) like we needed to like, I mean, we used it as that because, and what I mean is, um, until you're away from the the sport, specifically if you're a high level competitor, you think that everyone cares so much about how you do in competition, and that it's like this big deal to everybody mm-hmm. else. And as soon as you're away from it for even just a little while, you realize it's not that it's not awesome, mm-hmm. and that it's not special and cool and such an amazing opportunity and the and a life changing experience. But li- really, nobody follows it and cares that's not in it also themselves. Mm -hmm. Like I watch, I I still enjoy watching the CrossFit games and stuff, but Mm -hmm. like, I don't know who a lot of the people are now. Mm -hmm. And I have a few people that I still know that compete that I like to watch and see how they do, Mm -hmm. but like how they place changes 0% about what I think about them (laughs) as individuals. And if they stopped competing, like it wouldn't change how I thought about them or anything. But when you're in it, you think, everyone cares so much. It's the whole world. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Totally. Totally. And I think it's been, and and also just to back up, I would, I don't think I would have necessarily changed anything. I think at that point in my life and, and probably in order to be at a really high level in any sport, like it has to be your main focus and you're intentionally making some of those sacrifices. I think I could have done better with some of the things like certain relationships and things like that. But, um, but I, you know, I don't regret that. And I'm happy with my, you know, focusing on it at that time. But, um, I think something that's been really healing for me since retiring from, you know, CrossFit games competing has been just developing relationships outside of CrossFit because there was so much of me that like, 
I, it, it almost like feeds your ego in a weird way. Or you wonder, do people only want to talk to me because I compete in the CrossFit games or because I can do Fran really fast or whatever? Like <laughs> they actually care about me as a person. Am I like, is that all I am? And so that was part of, I think my growth post competing was just developing outside of that and meeting people who knew nothing about CrossFit and nothing about, you know, my history there and developing relationships just based on, you know, who I am as a person. Absolutely. Yeah. I think there's, I think there's completely a time or place and quite honestly, like competing, it added so much to who, who I am as a person, because, you know, I mean, that training is nuts and you learn a lot about yourself and you oh learn gosh. about how to overcome like so much discomfort and just yes. tiredness and everything similar to the seminar staff. Like I learned so much about myself through the amount of travel and waking up at 6 a.m. in some weird country where I don't even speak the language. Like, you know, <laughs> so I wouldn't have changed anything either. Like it's, mm -hmm. but I think recognizing when it's time to make a shift, mm -hmm. um, my, is, is important because I think people can get, I've seen, I've seen people who get stuck in it for too long and it's like, mm -hmm. Hey, like, it's okay. Like you don't have to compete anymore. Like just, mm -hmm. and I don't know what's, what's going on in their mind or, mm -hmm. or maybe they are just still doing it because mm -hmm. they love it. But, um, I think it is hard for all of us to move on when yeah. it's time to move on and find our next phase. Totally. And like you said, finding the reasons, right? Like there are certain people, if you talk to Annie Thor's daughter, like she is so happy and she loves training and she loves competing. And it's like so cool to see her doing that. There are other people that I think maybe are just doing it because they don't want to let go or they think they should, or they feel like they're a failure if they stop or they change things. And so much of it is about just like doing that self-examination of why am I doing this? And is it really what I want to be doing or focusing my time and energy on? Or are there other things that are more important to me? Yeah, totally. Well, let's talk about street parking now. Okay. <laughs> so you're with Julian. You, you know, decide you want to not travel all the time because you love him so much and want to <laughs> spend more time with him. So how does street parking come about? Super randomly. It was, so I, uh, I'm like an idea person. So I always have these random ideas. I don't know if you remember, but when, I, before I moved and when I was still with NorCal, we did um, the NC lab. Yes. Mm -hmm. Which was like, we started an Instagram and a, and a website and we were like, let's just show people the workouts that we're doing and they can follow along. And it was not appropriate programming for like regular people at all. Mm. Um, and this was like 2014. So it was before there was like all these different competitor programs. We didn't charge any money for it or anything. Mm -hmm. We just shared what shared we did. Workouts. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I started an Instagram. It was like a year into Instagram, at least for me at the time. And we would just throw it up there. And we got a huge follow -up. People loved it. They loved mm -hmm. just seeing what we were doing. And so street parking was a random idea just like that. So mm -hmm. at the time, um, Julian, I was traveling not anymore for CrossFit, but I had traveled so much for CrossFit. I was traveling a lot with Progenics and Julian would come with me mm -hmm. on a lot of those trips. And he was still training to compete. Mm -hmm. um, and he lived in an area in LA where the traffic gets crazy. Um, and so a lot of times he would work out at home mm -hmm. because it just wasn't even worth it to try to drive to the gym. Mm -hmm. And so he was working out at home. We, I was working out in a lot of hotels and things like that. We were working out in a lot of hotels and things like that together. And I was just like, we should start an Instagram account yeah. for people like that who can do stuff at home or maybe they travel a lot. Um, and yeah, that was like the whole that was the idea. Yeah. <laughs> and and so, it's totally yeah, we I, I um was familiar with Wattify, so I was like, we could just reach out to Wattify, and people could pay like ten dollars or twenty dollars, and um so they can like get to know each other and see mm -hmm. like each other's scores and things like that, and maybe we'll have like this little community that works out at home. That was like as much thought as went into it. Mm -hmm. I and love so, that though. I love that it was just this random thought, and then it totally evolved and grew and just took off based on what your community wanted and needed. It sounds like. Yeah. And obviously, so he had competed in the games in 2015 too. So we were recognizable, obviously. And I put it on my own personal Instagram that we were mm -hmm. going to do it. He did the same thing. And, um, it was just how it took off was not at all. We thought it would be cool if we had a hundred members to help pay like our utility bills. And I worked <laughs> for Progenics and he had a meal prep company mm -hmm. and it wasn't, we didn't have like this grand business plan. We still don't really. <laughs> um, 
And when we launched it, like in the first month we had, I want to say 500 members or something wow. like that. Yeah. And so we were like, oh crap, like now these people like expect us to keep this going. <laughs> and so we started to take it more yeah. serious. And and it's just kind of like, it's been like a runaway train ever mm-hmm. since then that we're like chasing and trying to keep up with. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, I, it's unbelievable what it's become. And obviously COVID added a lot mm-hmm. to it. Um, but we were, we had, we had like 15,000 plus members even before that. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, the timing was was great to, I think, just build off of that with COVID, but obviously there was a big need even before. Um, What are some of the things that you've learned through your members that you were surprised about that were things that they were looking for or wanted that they weren't finding elsewhere? That's a really good question. Well, the first thing that surprised me was a few days after we launched the Instagram account, um, I found out I was pregnant. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) And (laughs) Like you, I had this identity, even after the, after breaking my neck and tearing my ACL and everything, I had this identity that I thought was so important within the CrossFit community that was Miranda with the abs and the backwards hat and the whole thing. Like that mm-hmm. was who I was, right? And immediately when I was like, I found out I was pregnant, I told Julian, I was like, this is, no one's going to want to sign up for this program now because mm-hmm. they want that they want the Miranda abs, like cool Mm -hmm. chick or whatever. And I just don't think that people are going to want to see me in the demos (laughs) pregnant. I believe and know wholeheartedly that street parking would not be where it is today if I wouldn't have been pregnant when we launched it. Because the first thing that we learned is how many moms and dads need Mm -hmm. an alternative to be able to do at home because Mm -hmm. life gets crazy when you have kids and getting to a class on time or Maybe your facility doesn't have daycare or at least not for all the classes or whatever. Like that need was much bigger. It parents weren't even something on my mind when we started street parking Mm -hmm. because I, I wasn't one, you know, so I didn't know. Um, but the first thing that I learned is how vital it is for busy people, but especially parents to have resources and an option to do when their kid is sick or Mm -hmm. when just life happens, Mm -hmm. um, which is very often when you have little kids. Mm -hmm. And I would say I've seen that for sure. I know I have several friends who, you know, were gym members, even involved in owning, running, coaching at gyms who now have become moms who just love street parking because they're, they're just not able to get to the gym as much. Um, and it gives them an option to do that's efficient and that's accessible and to have the community of also other moms who are in a similar situation is really powerful. I think too, it made me relatable more than I had ever been before, Mm -hmm. even with my injuries. Like it was like this, the athletes, I would say, especially even now that it's like watching a Marvel movie, you know what I mean? Where it's like aspirational, but you don't relate to those people at all. Like it's so far past what would be appropriate for you to be doing Mm -hmm. where now I'm like pregnant and people like it was people were like, well, I want to see how this is going to go, you know? Yeah. Like, let's see. (laughs) You know, And then the recovery and I've been pregnant now three times in the whole time that we've had street parking. And so it's relatable in that, like, oh man, like she's, you know, she has a a lot of weight, not a lot compared to, you know, whatever, but I, you know, I gained some fat when I was Mm -hmm. pregnant and I had to lose it. And I had pregnancy symptoms like pubic symphysis and all this Mm -hmm. stuff that I was working through. And I've always felt comfortable sharing a lot of myself on social Mm -hmm. media because I do think that um, leading by example is more powerful than just telling people what to do. Mm -hmm. And so I shared a lot of it. And um, yeah, I think that 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 I became more relatable Mm -hmm. in that way than before it was more fans. And now it's more people who can feel like they can gain something from just the example that Mm -hmm. I'm setting. And I was going to say too, you maybe became more relatable, not just because you're pregnant, but because of how you approached it and you've shared and been vulnerable, like you said, and just, you have been real and authentic on social media, which not everybody does, even when they are pregnant. Um, so it's hard. I mean, people go into like hiding during that stuff and I get Mm -hmm. it. Like, cause people can also be rude and be like, I can't believe you're working out. You shouldn't be doing that, blah, blah, blah. Or Mm -hmm. I lost a ton of followers. I think I lost in that first pregnancy, something like 30,000 followers. Mm -hmm. And if your ego is too tied up in that, 
you can be like, well, obviously people just don't want to see me pregnant and you get mm-hmm. self-conscious about it. And I totally get why, yeah. but, but now you have the right followers. <laughs> so, exactly. That's right. That's right. It's probably just um, a bunch of dudes to be honest. <laughs> probably. <laughs> <laughs> probably. Um, well, I think it's amazing and how you, how you shared your journey and really bring people along with you. And in this community has seemed to grow so authentically um, and just evolved. I, I think one of the other things that I love about um, your approach is that you're so, you're not afraid to speak truth. So it's a place that feels very safe. Um, and this is me speaking from like the outside. It's not like I'm in the nitty gritty or doing it every day, but it's just from what I see, it invites, like, it feels safe. It feels like, okay, I'm going to be welcome here. I'm going to be able to be accepted. And like, no matter where I'm at in my journey, but yet you also don't coddle people. And you're also going to be honest about, you know, this stuff is hard and like consistency is important and not taking shortcuts and all those kinds of things. So that is such a rare combination um, so I'm, I'm curious just about how that evolved or how you dance, I guess, dance along that line that might be difficult sometimes. It is difficult, especially, um, two, two ways. It's difficult when you're, the group is so big. So the message that people need is different depending on the person. I mean, you know, that like, I'm sure as a doctor, like the way that you can speak to one person, you have to be a little bit gentler with mm-hmm. the next patient that you see, even if the information is the same based on who they are. And Mm -hmm. so it it is tough with the group that's as diverse as ours. Um, And also it's really tough when 99% of our members have never met me in person or met anyone that works for us in person Mm -hmm. where things can really get lost in translation or be taken out of context or taken the wrong way um, over social media. Mm -hmm. Um, And that happens for sure. Like people (laughs) get offended or people take something the wrong way, or they, they want to be coddled. They're used to being coddled. They're used to having, you know, an advertisement, tell them that it's going to be easy, or they're used to being told they need to do more. And we're like, no, you don't need to do more. You just need to keep doing it all the time. Mm-hmm. And it's not what they want to hear or whatever. So, um, it's not to say that we don't have people that don't like our message, but at the end of the day, like, I just don't know any other way. Like, I think that you you could gain a lot more members, whether it's us or any program out there, if you sold something that was a little bit more enticing. <laughs> but how long is that? Like, what's the longevity of that? Mm-hmm. And um, if anything, I'm I err on the side of being so honest because I just authenticity to me as a as a person, just an individual, is so important. Um, that I would rather have that than almost anything else. Like just being, just telling people the way that it is. And we talk about it in our meetings all the time. Like not everybody is ready to hear it Mm -hmm. and they might cancel and leave, but eventually when they are ready for it, they'll know that our message has been the same since the day we started to today. There's nothing about our message that has changed. We've never like randomly had some weird program um, that's just popular right now. And right. so we're going to throw it in there. The Nothing 30 day up. ab program. Or, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> or like we could make a bunch more money if we created our own supplement line, or if we created our own equipment and like, mm-hmm. you know, did some, some stuff like that, but, um, that would take resources away and time away and focus away from what our message is. And our message is just consistency, accountability. And, um, one of the things that we talk about a lot is fitness freedom where going back to like CrossFit rehab. And by the way, when I say CrossFit rehab, I'm not even talking about CrossFit Inc or CrossFit HQ because the message there is completely aligned with street parking, Mm -hmm. but some people need CrossFit rehab from the culture in their boxes Mm -hmm. where people come in and they're like, what's RX weight for this? And we're like, well, we kind of have like a suggested range, but like Mm -hmm. Really, if you read the coach's notes, it says like, just make sure that you can hit the time goal of the workout and that you can do 10 in a row every time you pick it up. Like whatever mm-hmm. that is for you, that's what you, what there's no RX button to hit here. Or yeah. um, we had to really coach people and teach people for the first few years about like, Hey, like we don't know rep each other on the Facebook group. Like <laughs> if somebody's wall ball target looks low. We don't care if somebody's <laughs> box is definitely not 20 inches. Like 
also no one cares. Um, and we, you know, so it's fitness freedom. If you want to do the first two rounds with your sandbag and the last three rounds with your dumbbells, like go for it. Mm -hmm. Because for us, it's, it's just finding what works for you that day in that moment and just mm -hmm. moving, um, and having the freedom to make your own decisions. And we try to educate as much as possible to help people make decisions as opposed to us just telling you what to do and you following this program that you feel like you need to do it perfectly or you messed mm -hmm. it up. Mm -hmm. so we try to give a lot of ed education along with even just the daily workouts. Mm -hmm. I love that. And, and like, like, you know, at its core and the methodology that's taught at the CrossFit level one, that's totally in alignment with it, with 100%. this, you know, infinite scalability. But I agree that sometimes that message gets misinterpreted or, you know, um, people just put too much pressure on themselves or focus on maybe the wrong things, um, in different environments. So, which is just like, like you said, as a result of something growing so quickly and so, um, with so many different people with different opinions and values and ways that they interpret that message. We actually have a lot of gym owners that are members. And I think it's awesome. I mean, we, they'll reach out to us and they'll say like, Hey, what do I need to pay to use your programming at our gym? Cause our mem our monthly membership is $19. Mm -hmm. And we say like, just go for it. We can't control cool. that. I'm sure there mm -hmm. are people who are doing it. And we just ask them like, Hey, just let your members know that it's street parking in case they move away or they, you know, mm -hmm. whatever they travel so that they can still find it. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, lo we love having them in there because they see like, we provide all the different modifications and customizations and there's three different versions based on the equipment and all of that. So, I mean, they, if I was an affiliate owner, I would at least want to like get some ideas. Yeah, totally. Totally. <laughs> yeah. You have, I mean, such a experienced team on it too. So that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, I feel like I wanted to ask you so many questions about being a mom and having kids, but I feel like we might need to do a whole nother podcast about right. that, but maybe just, maybe just kind of a, a summary question of anything just reflecting now being a mom of three kids on the whole process, who you were pre kids who you are now, you know, things that maybe have surprised you or that you've, that you've learned the most from becoming a mom and maybe ways that we can better serve our moms in our fitness community as a whole. The biggest thing that I've learned about myself is, um, and this isn't really a fitness thing, but I do think that it's interesting. And, and I wonder if other moms who are like me feel this the way that I do. So I've always loved to work, obviously, like I traveled so much and my whole entire life was like this CrossFit career. And I never, I wasn't at all prepared for this, like almost straight up, like split personality of there are moments in every single day where I think like, I don't want to, I mean, we have this amazing company that is doing something that I love and that I've built from the ground up and working with people that I love. And there's still moments in every single day where I'm just like, I don't want to do this. I just want to be with my kids. I want to mm -hmm. be a stay at home mom with my kids. Mm -hmm. And that from childhood is not something that I would have expected in my personality at all. I've mm -hmm. always been like, involved in all the things and such like a, a worker. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that has been like a huge surprise and a huge struggle for me because I still love what I do every day. And I'm so passionate about it. And I see so much potential with street parking, but there are moments every single day mm -hmm. where I, where I'm like, Nope, throw in the towel. Like, I just want to be a stay at home mom and hang out with my kids all day long. Mm -hmm. Um, and that was surprising for me. That's really um, cool. It's, it's it crazy. Yeah. Just how it changes your perspective. I think one of the things that, um, could answer your question better about like, how can we serve moms? I think there's just so much fear that women go through when they're pregnant mm -hmm. that comes from all everywhere. Like there's so much confusion of like, you shouldn't be doing this. You should be doing this. You, and, and it, the, they're all contradict each other. Mm -hmm. And, um, some of the things that I personally experienced is, um, what the first time I got pregnant, I was 34 mm -hmm. and I was treated like I was like the oldest <laughs> pregnant woman to ever live and mm -hmm. like all of these tests and everything. And it was all very scary. And, um, I was going to a regular OB, um, in Southern California when I was pregnant with my first, mm -hmm. um, I was asked 
because I was so lean at the time. Like if I had an eating disorder, which mm-hmm. I was just like, you know, the, just the assumptions that are made on your mm-hmm. age and your fitness level uh, that that I was told that my baby was going to be super small when he totally wasn't. It was just because my abdominal wall was so strong that <laughs> my belly didn't get as big as most people's did. Mm-hmm. So there's just, there's a lot of that, that there's so much fear around pregnancy. And one of the things that I've really embraced and learned, I had the opportunity to have my second two both at home. Mm-hmm. And um, the reason that I had number two at home was because it was during COVID Mm-hmm. And there was a, a, we live in Washington, which, where there was every regulation that you could have, we had here. Okay. And so it was like, we didn't even know if Julian was going to be able to come, let alone if that my son, my other son was going to be able to be yeah. there. And so we, I had a healthy pregnancy, everything. We we're like, let's just do it at home so that we don't have to worry about any of that. Mm-hmm. And through that experience, and then through my third pregnancy, um, just how natural the process really is and how connected with your body you can be um, if you let go of all the scary stuff that you think. Yeah. And I think just doing, I think doing a better job of helping women through that and not making them so afraid of every little decision that they're making. Mm -hmm. I love that. I think, I think that's something too, we can probably extrapolate into all of our lives, even outside of pregnancy is just how much, especially in the world right now, like how much fear holds all of us back, um, in, in just day to day life. I love that. I was also noticing too, your Instagram handle is at fearless Miranda. Where did the, where did that name come from? So this is a really funny story that your CrossFit crowd will love. <laughs> in 2015, when I tore my ACL, my Instagram handle was CrossFit Miranda. It was CrossFit Miranda forever. Mm-hmm. Well, at the games in 2015, when I tore my ACL, Dave came down to where the doctors were checking out my knee. They told me that we didn't share the story back then. Cause one of the things that I've always been careful about, whether it was then or through street parking is I know how important CrossFit is and the message of CrossFit is. So even if I am having a moment where I have a not the best relationship with CrossFit, I have never and will never talk badly about it because I know how important it is and how mm-hmm. it changed my life. And now I've been able to change so many others. Anyways, so back to the story. So I tore my ACL. Dave comes down. And he's like, you're out. You're done. I mean, you experienced something similar with your, with your yeah, affiliate. With my affiliate. Yeah. And I was like, what? No, I was like, we're, we're winning. Like just wrap, wrap it up. This is like Saturday morning. Like I was going to try for two more days. I'm like, just wrap it up. And like, I gotta, we gotta go do this. Like, I'll just do what I can do. But like, and he and I got in a pretty big fight for like several months about it Mm. um, and didn't talk. And he's a good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And so whatever, later that night, we are, we know we're not going to win now. We were supposed to win. We're all like depressed and sad. The night after the games were over, I think every, our whole team was like drinking by the pool and they were like, you got to change your Instagram. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I'm going to change it. <laughs> oh my gosh. And so I changed my Instagram handle when we were all like drunk at the pool and immediately I get a text from Dave. He's like, nice. You know, <laughs> that's so great. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not going to be CrossFit Miranda anymore. Like screw these guys. You know, so that, that's the true story that I don't think I've ever told anybody like on a podcast or anything. That's <laughs> I love that. I love that. <laughs> Wow. Well, where's the, so where the fearless come from then? It was just, it just seemed right. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I probably tried a couple other things and they weren't available. It makes sense. Yeah. Or whatever, but yeah, you're like, take that. That's so funny. I love (laughs) it. I was unafraid to change my name. I love it. Um, Well, (laughs) as we're, (laughs) yeah, this is a great note to wrap up on. Um, But as we're, as we start to wrap up, I have three questions I always ask at the end, but before that, what, what are you most excited about? You said you see so much potential for street parking. What gets you, you know, aside from being at home with your kids, what do you get most excited about when you think about the future of street parking? I just, the more people that, so so we have a a couple hundred people who have logged over a thousand street parking, uh, workouts. Mm -hmm. And the more people that have that light bulb moment of, 
it doesn't have to be this perfectly laid out program and it doesn't have to be so polished. And there are times when I do have time and, and energy and finances and everything for that. And when, I'm, and when I do, I'm going to go do it. But when I don't, I can just have a pair of dumbbells at home and make it happen. Like the more people that find that out, um, that's what excites me. And that's what keeps us going. It's like, even when we have like really hard days or, so, you know, something stressful is happening. If we go on our Facebook group and we see somebody that's like, I've never been this consistent in my whole life. Like, thank you for like shifting my mindset into knowing that even if I have to do something at the foot of my bed, it's enough. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, gosh, dang it. Okay. We will keep going for one day, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so it's, it's that. And, um, I don't think that it competes like we're talking about with the messaging of gym owners or anything, because ultimately if somebody falls out of consistency because they can't come to your, your gym, um, that's not good for you either. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if for a few weeks while their kid is sick, they can do some stuff at home, they're, they're going to come back to you so much sooner, mm -hmm. or they're going to get better results if two days a week, they have to do something at home just because of their schedule. So, right. um, it's very much aligned and, and I'm excited to continue to spread that message as well. Mm -hmm. I love that. I love that. And I think especially in this post pandemic world where so many people have built out home gyms or have some equipment at home makes a lot of sense. I know for me personally, I, I find doing a couple workouts a week at home is just more efficient, you know, instead yeah. of having to drive to the gym and do a full hour class. So I love that. Well, rapid fire last three questions. Um, the first one is what are the three things that you do on a regular basis that have the biggest positive impact on your health? Oh, well, I not sleep. That's not one. <laughs> that might answer my next question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I work out mm -hmm. still five days a week, sometimes six. Um, it's never longer than like 45 minutes that I'm in the garage, but it's I'm very consistent with that. Mm -hmm. uh, my food is also very, very consistent. And I think that's really helped me to um, do well during my pregnancies and allowed me to breastfeed and all mm -hmm. of that stuff. And and so we eat most of our meals at home mm -hmm. and it really doesn't change what it is. And we've just kind of found a rhythm with it, which I think is important for parents. Like you, you can't put too much thought into it or mm -hmm. have to prep it too much because it's not going to happen otherwise. Mm -hmm. And then the third one is I've, I've become a lot more present with my boys when I'm with them. Like mm -hmm. I'm very careful to try not to be on my phone or to be distracted, um, because they, they just, they grow so fast. Mm -hmm. And I think for just like my joy and mental health and everything, just making sure that I am super present with them. And I don't feel like I'm neglecting those relationships is really important for me. I love that. My next question was, what is one thing you think would have an impact on your health, but you have a hard time implementing it. So that might be sleep for you. Um, and yes. then my, my last question is what does a healthy life look like to you, Miranda? That's a really good question. I think one of the things that we've been talking at Julian and I have been talking about a lot right now, because I just turned 40 a few months ago, um, is never settling. And I don't mean never settling. Like you always have to be PRing and this and that, but always growing in some way, always mm -hmm. still seeking out some discomfort and trying to be a little bit better in one area or another um, all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's not about perfectionism or anything like that, but I think just trying new things and improving, whether it's like uh, one area that I could improve, another area is like I could eat more vegetables. So just never, never settling. And, and that's in relationships and education mm -hmm. and all mm -hmm. of that. Too. Absolutely. Yeah. Being well-rounded in all of those different areas, always looking for improvement. I love that. I love that. Well, this has been amazing. Thank you so much, Miranda, for your time. And aside from finding you at Fearless Miranda on Instagram, I know you are also at street parking and streetparking.com and um, anywhere else that, that people can find what you're up to or learn more about what you're doing. No, that's good. Those are the, the main spots. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks so much for tuning in. If you enjoy listening to the podcast, please consider subscribing and giving it a five-star rating on iTunes. It really does help to get the word out to more people.